morning. Glad to have you here with us at the First United Methodist Church of Interlochen. Again, I appreciate your time and the opportunity that you're taking to tune in and hear this message. I just pray it encourages you in your spirit, it helps you in your Bible knowledge and understanding, and most importantly, it helps you and me both become more like Jesus Christ to a lost and hurting world. If the world needs anybody more now, it certainly needs Jesus. And you and I can reflect him by how we live, what we say, and what we do. So let's open up in a word of prayer, and we will get started. Father, thank you so much for your ever-abiding presence. Father, you tell us in the Old Testament that you're an ever-present help in time of trouble, and we claim the promise of Jesus that you will never leave us or forsake us. Lo, you're with us always, even until the end of the world. And I just pray now, Father, you would fill me with the Holy Spirit, you would fill everyone listening with the Holy Ghost, that you would fill us, Father, and help us to understand the Word of God as it's written. Father, the Scripture says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Let us hear the Word as you speak to us through the Scriptures and through the Holy Spirit's application. We put our trust in you, Father. In Christ's name, amen. Folks, I can remember growing up as a little boy and hearing a song on the radio. Devil with the blue dress, blue dress, blue dress, devil with the blue dress on. Chuck Berry was a very, very famous rock and roll artist. In fact, he was very instrumental in starting rock and roll to become popular. And that's one song that I remember he had that he sang. And he sang about a devil with a blue dress on, a girl that was really tempting him because of what she was wearing with what her clothes, what she had on as her clothes. And you know, clothing is so important how we dress, how we carry ourselves, and how we present ourselves. And really, as we look at this passage today, Paul is going to tell us to clothe ourselves in a certain way. It's interesting, if you go back and study the history of the ancient church, different students that had come to faith in Christ would be discipled by elders, and bishops, deacons in the church, and then after they can, had completed a series of classes, they would be eligible for baptism as they identified with the finished work of Jesus Christ. They would literally take off their old clothes. They would put on a special gown to be baptized with. They would go up to the baptismal font or to the water, to the pool, however they were administering the water. They would be baptized, and then when they got up out of and beyond the water, then they would be clothed in a brand new white robe to show that they had died to their old life and they were putting on a new life. And that's basically where we start out here in Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 12. We're going to be covering verse 12 here all the way through verse 17. Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17. So if you'd like to turn there with me in your Bible, again, I'm going to be teaching from the New International Version, the NIV. You might have a different version, but I'm sure it'll be somewhat similar. Paul starts off in verse 12 and says, Therefore, and whenever you see a therefore in Scripture, you ask yourself, what is the therefore, therefore? Based upon what he said back in verse 5 about, <coughs> excuse me, about putting certain things to death, old, sinful, evil habits, ways of the past, bad language, anger, rage, malice, in light of the fact that you put that off, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. And now he's going to talk about some virtues here that we're supposed to clothe ourselves with. I think it's interesting. The church is now God's chosen people, just like Israel primarily in the past in the Old Testament were the people of God. Now the church is the people of God. Uh, a chosen people, holy and dear beloved, Clothe yourselves, and the first thing he mentions is compassion. Clothe yourselves with compassion. It's interesting, in the gospel messages, in the gospel teachings, you see where Jesus looked out over a huge multitude of people, and he felt very, very lamenting and very, very remorseful for them. He had compassion on them because they were his sheep without a shepherd. And compassion is something that all of us really need to follow 
and need to have a compassionate heart toward everybody we deal with. It's interesting, when Jesus had taught about loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself, right after that passage, Jesus has told the story about the Good Samaritan. And many of us are familiar with that passage about the Good Samaritan, but just for to renew you and to renew your mind, I want to talk a little bit about that. Tells about a certain man was traveling on the road to Jericho, and sadly he fell among thieves. They tore his clothes and stole him. They took everything he had. They beat him and left him half dead, laying there along the roadside. And it's interesting. Jesus says that a priest comes by and sees him laying there, all beaten up and bleeding and wounded, and the priest chooses to pass by on the other side. You know, isn't that really kind of hypocritical when you think about it? A priest, somebody who was professionally a religious person, yet he didn't have any compassion in his heart. He passed by on the other side. Perhaps he didn't want to get his hands dirty. He didn't want to get involved. He really didn't care. Really sad. Then Jesus said a Levite came along the same path also. And when he saw the man all bruised and broken and hurting and bleeding, he passed by on the other side also. The Levites, all the priests, had to come from the tribe of Levi. And the rest of the Levites were responsible for different things in the temple. The furniture, the furnishings, different things like that. So he was another man that had a holy office to take care of. But he's another person that has absolutely no compassion. And then lastly, Jesus says, here comes along a Samaritan. A half-breed, a person that was half Jewish and half Assyrian, a person that really wasn't looked on too good from society, but when he sees the man, it says he had compassion toward him. He was moved with compassion. He took some oil and wine and bound up his wounds. He loaded the wounded man up upon his own animal. Apparently he had a donkey with him. He took that wounded man to an innkeeper and gave him some money for the man's room and said, look, I'll be back by here in a few more days, and if I owe you anything more for his care, let me know, and I'll fully repay you. And then he went his way. And then Jesus asked the scribe of that day, who was the person that had compassion? And of course, it was obvious it was the good Samaritan. I think God would want all of us to be a good Samaritan when an opportunity presents itself, a time that we can have compassion towards somebody, can show a little bit of love and show compassion toward that individual. I think about a time when I was a student out in Dallas, Texas, and I needed a good Samaritan in my life. You know, being in graduate school and finances being tight and everything like that, I didn't have too much money. I was kind of living on a shoestring and a prayer, so to speak. Things were really tight. And I had a 1970 Volkswagen. Well, the starter on that 1970 Volkswagen went out. But I found with a little Volkswagen that if I parked it up on a hill, I could get in, push the clutch down, get it moving and rolling, pop the clutch, and the motor would start. So I could still get it started, although my starter was broken. And that worked good for a while. But one Sunday morning, we were on our way to church, got in the little Volkswagen, put my foot on the clutch, Started going down the hill and popped the clutch and it started, but then it stalled. And luckily I was able to steer it over to the side of the road. Now where I had stopped at was right in the middle of a little bit of a valley, a little bit of a, of a, of a grove kind of a thing, where I couldn't possibly get it pushed up the hill to get it started again. I was down there in like the little valley area and I needed help. Well here came another seminary student along with his wife in his car, and he stopped and said, do you all need a ride to church? I said, well, yeah, we're going to, but I need to really try to see about getting my car started. Could you help me out here? Maybe put your bumper to my bumper and get me pushed up over the little hill, and I can pop a good clutch and get it started. He said, well, I don't really feel too comfortable doing that. I'm afraid I might hurt my car. I said, well, I've got a rubber bumper on my VW, and you've got a rubber bumper there. It shouldn't do any problem. And he still didn't feel comfortable with doing it. So I told him, well, you all just go on ahead and I'll see if I can get somebody to give me a push. So the other seminary student just drove off with his wife heading off to the church and I was still there. I prayed, Lord, I need help. Please help me, Lord. 
You know, about five minutes later, this Mexican man came driving along in an old beat-up jalopy, and he stopped and said, Hey, man, you need some help? I said, Oh, I certainly do. And he looked like that he hadn't shaved in a week. He had a couple of tooth teeth missing out of his head. He looked like just an average working guy, you know. He goes, well, What you need? I said, Well, if you'll put your bumper up to mine, push me up over this little bit of hill, and we can get some speed going, I can pop my clutch and start my car and be on the way to church. He goes, get in, man. So I got in my car and he put his bumper up to mine. We got up over the hill, we got going at good speed. I popped the clutch, it started, and kept on running, and I drove off to church. And I looked at him in the rearview mirror and stuck my hand out the window and waved, and he waved back. And I thought, what a good illustration of a good Samaritan to me. A guy you never thought would help you, just an average guy, you know, a Mexican and a Samaritan, but who showed compassion? You know, it's good to think biblically. It's right to be people of the word. But if we don't ever have compassion, we're like a person that's puffed up with knowledge and we're not able to give or do anything of ourselves. You know, we have a real good opportunity coming up to show compassion here because this coming two weeks from today, we're going to have a fifth Sunday offering for the United Methodist Children's Home. And here we have children that somebody needs to show compassion toward. You know, you and I perhaps were fortunate enough to have parents that cared for us and loved us, took good care of us and provided for us, but unfortunately, not all kids have that. We can show a little bit of compassion with the fifth Sunday offering, just trying to help out the United Methodist Children's Home. If things are tight for you right now and you can't do it, you know, we understand. The Lord understands that. But if you can help out, think about that fifth Sunday offering. It's a great way for us as a church to show compassion towards somebody that is very needy. Chapter 12, chapter 3, verse 12, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. Then he says also to clothe yourselves with kindness. What a beautiful metaphor of living your life and being kind. You know, when I think about kindness, I think about the ladies that got together this past Monday morning to wrap Christmas gifts for the children in the elementary school. They took their time, their experience and everything, and met at the parsonage and wrapped gifts so that a lot of the kids at the elementary school that necessarily wouldn't get a Christmas gift will be able now to get one. That's clothing yourself with kindness as you show kindness to other people around you. After compassion and kindness, he mentions the, the character quality of humility. Clothe yourself with humility. And I can think of no better illustration of humility than our Lord Jesus Christ. The Prince of Glory left glory to live life as a servant and to die on the cross to pay for our sins. And one of the most beautiful passages of Scripture that I love is John chapter 13, where after a meal is over, Christ girds himself as a servant, and one by one, he washes the disciples' feet. That was a task that was set aside for a lowly house slave, a lowly house servant, and one considered one of the most menial things you could do to wash the dirt off someone's feet. They all wore sandals back then. Their feet would have been dusty from the roads and paths they traveled on. And that servant would have to wash each guest's feet. And Jesus did that for each of his disciples. If he can do that, can't we take out the trash? Can't we do tasks that are sometimes considered menial or less than? We should be more than willing to do that if we're going to clothe ourselves with humility. Next, he mentions the character quality of gentleness. Are you known as a gentle person or are you harsh? Are you gentle in your speech and the way you communicate with other people? Are you off to let one go? Gentleness is something we need to strive to be. Compassionate, kind, humble, gentleness. And then lastly, he says, patience. Having patience with one another. And don't pray for patience because I guarantee if you do, you'll come on cause a trial because trials are the only way that you learn patience. And we've got to be patient with one another. Realize that none of us are perfect. None of us have arrived yet. We're on the path, but we're not fully sanctified yet. And we need to be patient with one another. 
The next one, he goes from beyond preaching to meddling. Look here in verse uh, 13. He says, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Bear with put another. Literally, put up with one another. You know, you can't have a crowd of people involved with one another day after day, week after week, year after year, without somebody stepping on somebody else's toes. And we need to realize, again, that none of us are perfect, none of us are arrived, and there's times when we're going to offend each other. But be quick to ask for forgiveness and bear with each other. And notice it says truly, forgive whatever grievances you may have. Somebody might say to me, well, Dave, you don't understand what he said. You know, I might not understand, but Scripture says here to forgive that person. But you don't understand what he did. Well, forgive that person. Why? As the Lord forgave you. God is so gracious that he forgives us through Jesus Christ every single sin we've ever committed in the past, every mistake we'll make today, and every sin we'll sin in the future. God forgives completely, totally, and he never brings it back up. So be quick to forgive and let offenses go. Realize that none of us are perfect. We're bound to rub shoulders wrong sometimes, knock heads, step on one another's toes, spill something or do something like that that could be offensive. But be quick to forgive as the Lord forgave you. What a beautiful metaphor of clothing yourselves with all these virtues. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievance you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And I love this last one here in verse 14. Over all these virtues, put on love. Love, what does it say about love? It binds them all together in perfect unity. You know, when you love someone, it's a whole lot easier to forgive them, isn't it? Think of the love you have for your children and how though they've made many mistakes, you still forgive them and love them. Why? They're your kids. Think of the love you have for your spouse, your husband or your wife. And even though they might offend you sometimes and get on your nerves and halfway drive you crazy, you still got to forgive. I remember my mom telling us kids one time, if you kids keep this up, you're going to drive me to Chattahoochee. <laughs> Chattahoochee is a state mental asylum up in the panhandle. And we would really get on her nerves. But after the end of the day, she always forgave us. And we always promised, Mama, if you don't tell Daddy what we did, we promise we'll never do it again. And she'd say, well, okay. So if she didn't tell Dad, we were in even better shape. But true love forgives. And love is considered that girdle, that belt, that binds them all together in perfect unity. Think about how rich, about how beautiful and lovely these character qualities are that we're to put on compared with the things that we were talking about not doing last week that we put off. The anger, the wrath, the rage. Beautiful picture here of what we should be in Christ. Then verse 15 he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. How do I make decisions? By letting the Holy Spirit live in me, the Word of God, the peace of Christ ruling in my heart. Let the Holy Spirit be the umpire when it comes to situation for you to do. You know, sometimes I'll think something or I'll say something, and immediately I can see a referee throwing a yellow penalty flag. You might say, Dave, you're watching too much football. Perhaps I am, but I see those penalty flags flying all the time. And the Holy Spirit will do that to you. He'll convict you, he'll throw that penalty flag, and maybe you need to apologize for what you said or even what you thought. Say, Lord, forgive me, help me start over again. Let him be an umpire to rule different decisions you make, especially in dealing with one another. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since, as members of one body, one body of Christ, you are called to peace. Folks, I know you are a lot like me. I think we all have similar backgrounds. We've worked hard all of our lives. We've done what we try to do the best we could. We accepted Christ as our Savior. 
We're trying to grow as Christians. That's why we're here in church. We're all really cut out of the same mold. We're members of one body, and we were called to peace. I love peace and harmony. I love getting along with Carol, my wife, in our home. And we generally have a very, very peaceful home. I love getting along with my son and my grandchildren. And it's cool to be able to get along with them in peace. And thankfully, we have a ministry here, a church here, where for the most part, we get together and we get along in peace. Like Elton John saying, harmony and peace are pretty good company. They really are. And to be at peace among ourselves is so, so precious. It says back in the Old Testament, how beautiful and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. We're getting along, we're working toward the gospel goals, we're serving God together, and we're working in harmony and peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Folks, next month is Thanksgiving, the fourth Thursday of the month, and it'll be a time that we remember to stop and give thanksgiving to God for all that he's done for us. Thanksgiving has three elements. A person you're thankful to, Almighty God, you as that person, and then the attitude of gratitude that we have as we thank God for all we have. I look around this morning and nobody had to be wheeled in here on a hospital bed. Nobody had to come in with a seeing eye dog. Nobody had to come in who's not in their right mind. For the most part, pastor perhaps excluded. You don't know. But, uh, you know, God has blessed us so much. We have homes. We have roofs over our heads. We have plenty of food to eat. We have shoes on our feet. God has blessed us, and we need to maintain that attitude of gratitude. Then he says that the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as you teach and admonish one another. Notice he said that we teach and admonish one another. Body life ministry. You know, we're used to church with the minister being the guy up front preaching. But realistically, we're all minister as we minister together in the body. And here we teach and admonish one another. You know, educators that study education as a science and that teach it in universities say that adults learn best through dialogue. People talk to you and you talk to other people. People get together in small groups and talk. And that's so, so important because that's how we learn as adults through dialogue. We don't learn through lectures. You learn a little bit that way. But we learn mostly through dialogue. That's how you really get to know somebody and they get to know you. And here we admonish and teach one another with all wisdom and look at this, this is a favorite of mine here too, as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to the Lord. Notice three things he mentioned. Psalms, singing psalms out of the Old Testament, hymns, traditional hymns that we have, and also spiritual psalms, new praise courses that people come up with. Just like last Sunday we sang, above all powers, above all kings, above all created things, crucified, laid behind the stone. He lived to die, rejected it alone, like a rose trampled on the ground. He took the fall and thought of me above all. Beautiful contemporary praise course. And a lot of those praise courses are singing about God or directly to God, and we need to be open when somebody writes a new song and comes along. It says in Revelation that some of the people sang a new song unto the Lord. I love the traditional hymns. I grew up with the traditional hymns. I'll always love them. I love the songs set to music. But I also love the modern praise choruses too. The things we sing to the Lord. So, so meaningful and so, so in-depth. And notice again, you're singing in your hearts to God. You're not singing for the guy sitting next to you. You're not singing for anybody in the choir. You're singing to God. When my daughter was real young, perhaps a year and a half, two years old, I remember coming home from work, and as I looked into her room, her crib was against this wall, and she was facing that way. And I looked around the corner, and she was just rocking back and forth, just singing this little baby song, and it was so cute. And I looked at her, and I said, Hi, 
Melanie. And she turns around with her curly head and says, Daddy! And put her arms up for me to take her. Uppy, uppy. And I picked Melanie up and held her. When we sing to God, I think he's placed the same way that I was here my little daughter sing to me. Little baby song, didn't make much sense. It was cute, but it ministered to me. Imagine God in heaven as you sing praises to him, how it's a sweet, sweet sound in his ear, as that one praise chorus says. Keep singing, keep doing it, keep praising God. And then he ends here with whatever you do, whether in word or deed, what we say or what we do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You can glorify God no matter what you're doing. Well, I've got to mow the lawn today. That's just a very mundane task. You can pray while you're mowing. You can think about the Lord. And when you get done mowing and you stand back and look how nice the yard looks when it's all trimmed and weed eaten and mowed, you did it for the glory of God. And you can be happy about that. God is with us at every moment. Through every mundane task, every menial thing we do, God is with us. And do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So put on that new dress. Don't be the devil with the blue dress on. Be the saint with the white robe on. And by dressing in Christ's righteousness, by trying to emulate these character qualities, by trusting the Holy Spirit to work that in your soul, you can become the person that God would have you to be, and you'll be living like Jesus Christ. And that's true maturity. True maturity is Christ-likeness, being like Him. And that's the goal we strive toward. Remember back when he talked about, in verse 10 there, about being renewed in knowledge of the image of its Creator? God is working on our, on our self-esteem. He's working on our self-image. He's restoring the image of God in us so that we become little Jesuses as we run around and try to help people in this word, world. Show compassion. Show what his heart is like to other people. You'll win a whole lot more people with compassion you can with, with, with sugar than you can with vinegar, as the old proverb says. So clothe yourself with kindness, clothe yourself with humility, and see what God will do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the clear instructions you give us in your word. And Lord, we know we cannot do it in our own power, in our own strength. We don't have the will or the heart to do it. For the prophets told us, it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And I pray you would fill us with the spirit, you use the Spirit, Father, to be the umpire in our heart, and you would help us to the people that reflect the love and goodness of Jesus to all those around us. Father, especially as we head toward Thanksgiving, just thank you, thank you, thank you for so much you've done for us here at Interlochen. Our new sound system, the blessings of the upkeep and the maintenance we've been able to get accomplished. Thank you so much, Father, for how you love us and care for us each and every day. Help us go forth, Father, and be a good Samaritan to somebody in need, to show compassion, to perhaps spend a little money, spend a little time in doing something to minister to somebody we find along life's roadway. We ask you for the strength and the power to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, thank you so much for being with us. I hope this message has been an encouragement and uplifting to you. And I encourage you again to go back through the week and read through the book of Colossians. Go back over these scriptures and meditate and chew on it for yourself. You know, there's nothing like a hand-picked cherry that you've picked out of scripture yourself to bite into to nourish you. Stay in the Word and be blessed. Thank you again for joining us.